I'm really glad to be here on the second day of my big bus tour. I don't know how many of you saw that bus, but we drove from Norwell, Massachusetts. So today I'd tell, like to tell you a little bit about how I got the idea for this book. I'm going to draw you a picture and make it like a drawing lesson. And then last of all, a few words about your creativity. And my talk part will probably take 20 to 30 minutes, and then it will be time for the book signing. But I hope that you all pay attention with the drawing part because I, I think I have a fun project for you. Well, when I go out to my mailbox or look at my email, the question kids ask me the most is, how do I get ideas for my books? And that's because so many of you are writing your own stories. So I hope there's more than one of you here that is going to be a writer or an illustrator someday. And even if you're not going to do that for a profession, that you experiment with this wonderful way to express yourself. Well, when I was a little girl, we had lots of animals, and I loved them. And my idea was that I wanted to run away from home and live with the animals. And it really wasn't that I wanted to run away from anything. I just wanted to run to the animals. And my plan was to live in the barn with my horse in a stall, and that my mother would come out and bring me grilled cheese sandwiches, which was my idea of running away food. <laughs> Well, the, she said, no, 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 I could not do that. But I kept that idea in my mind until all these years later, I thought up a story about a little troll boy who's very naughty and mischievous, decides he doesn't want to do his chores, and runs off to live with the animals. And I've been to Norway several times. Some of my books have been set there. And I would always ask people, do you know any troll stories? And they always did. And one of the ones I liked the best was that trolls never can be bothered to dry, brush their hair. So that's why their hair always sticks straight up. I heard another one about the Holder ma Maidens. And trolls and Holder Maidens come from Norse mythology, which is very old belief in storytelling from way back in Scandinavia, and, and, and in the olden days, the trolls were kind of mean and scary and huge. And as time has gone on, the trolls have gotten nicer until they've ended up in my books, and now this troll's very cute. <laughs> but he has a tail. And the way I got the idea about the whole tail thing was, well, some trolls do have them, some don't. But the Holdar maidens, would be these beautiful girls who would come to Earth, but they weren't be, wouldn't be truly human. They were immortal, but they had a cow's tail in the back, and they had dresses that covered it up, and they would find a human mortal man to marry them. And when the this is this is what they tell me, when the church bells rang, and the marriage ceremony to the mortal man, the tail would drop off, and she would quickly kick it aside so no one would associate that horrible tail with her, and then off she would go to live the life of a human being. Of course, she would lose her immortality. Well, I thought that might happen to Rolo the Troll. So he starts out with his tail, and it's not a good tail. It's kind of a look, look one coming off a pig. It's not good, a good one. And he goes off to live with different animals until he finally, as Christmas rolls along, he starts getting homesick. And that's when he um, ends up with a moose family. And he's riding on the moose's antlers now. If an animal has antlers around late fall, early winter, those antlers fall off, and that animal will grow them new again in the spring. And when Rollo's riding on the antler, it falls off, and he's on it. He's all of a sudden overcome with sadness that he's so far from home in the deep snow on the top of a mountain, but that antler starts to rock with his crying. And I brought you an antler that I found in Sweden. I found it in Sweden, way up in Karuna, which is almost to the Arctic Circle, Actually, my friend Elof found it. And could you picture a little troll on this? And he starts to cry, and it starts to loosen its way out of the snow and starts sliding down like a toboggan down the mountain. So he holds on up here, and he zooms down the mountain in no time at all. And of course, he's going, wahoo! You know, his sadness turns to happiness very quickly. And that's a troll trait. And uh, his family down in the valley below hear him. They're out cutting their cu Christmas tree, and they go find Rolo. They hear those cries, and then he's reunited with his parents. And that, to me, is the most fun part about holidays. It's that's the time we get together with our brothers, sisters, cousins, mom, dad, and um, have a, a happy Christmas together, or, ho or whatever holiday that you um, are celebrating. And so that's the... Oh, 
One thing about the uh, antler I found out was very interesting from Elof, who is a hunter. If a uh, moose loses one antler, then his, this is pretty heavy. His head is like this. <laughs> so he immediately has to find like a big rock or a tree to kind of pull against the other with the other antler until the other one is loosened and that falls off too. So if you find one in the tundra like I did, then the idea is you go in uh, circles further and further away from the antler until you find the other one. Now it was getting really dark and we were getting a little worried we were lost so we never found the second one. But I had the hardest time bringing that back from customs from Sweden <laughs> because we got a suitcase for it and sure enough they said, you know, if you're bringing any agricultural products now, I don't know if that was an agricultural product, but we are probably too honest for our own good. And they did not want to bring it, let us bring it in. But because it had been left out all winter and the weather kind of cleansed it, they said it was okay. There was no biological material on it. <laughs> so um, this is the beginning of my adventure in Sweden. I saw all the animals in Stockholm. There's a great open air museum called Skansen. So if you're ever in Sweden, I saw the lynx, the otter, the gray owl, a beautiful, beautiful animal, and then, of course, the moose. And when I went to uh, Sweden, I hadn't decided whether I was going to have Rollo the Troll go coming tobogganing down the mountain on a reindeer antler or a moose antler, because in the United States, you usually see a bull moose, which is the male, or the cow moose, which is the female, by themselves. You don't see family groups. The first day in Sweden, we went to Elof's farm, and there were nine ra um, moose. There was uh, bulls and uh, cows and calves. So I said, aha, I can use a moose. So that was great fun to um, be able to draw. So I am going to draw you a picture of the moose. And I'm going to do it like an art lesson. And I'm going to start out with some basic shapes. This is what I would normally do with my pencil. So I'm just going to use a thin line. But I have to do it dark enough so that you can see in the way back. So you're going to have to imagine that I could erase the first part. And it's going to be just the moose head. Because I was thinking that you could maybe make a Christmas card or a winter card with a moose on the front. And on the antlers, you could hang different things. And you could, you could decide what goes on the antlers. So I'm going to make mine. And I'm going to know. I know the antler is going to be up here. So I'm going to start the head way down here. So already I'm starting to plan my picture. Antlers, head. So I'm just going to use a rectangle right here. And everybody knows how to draw a rectangle, am I right? It's just a long square. And then I'm going to kind of follow that line back here. And this is going to be the, uh, the mooses. They have a hump on their back. You can kind of see back there. And I'm going to have his neck come down and then go up in the hump and then back down to where his back is. And then his, you're, you're probably used to drawing horses. Their necks curves this way. The animals that are in the deer family, like a moose, their necks curve the other way. And then here's where his shoulder comes down. And then I'm just going to take like a flying saucer shape that's going to be his ear. And then right here will be his antler. Now there's two kinds of things that grow out of uh, animals' heads. <laughs> One is a horn, and that's like a cow, gazelle, uh, antelope, and those are attached to the skull and they never come off. An antler, those you see white-tailed deer and moose, those come off every year. They say they shed them and they will grow back in all one year. So I'm going to make kind of an upside down C and then I'm going to put my hand right here on top of it. And I'm going to trace my hand. And you can do this too. And I'm just, if I had a pencil, this would be much better. I'm trying to get these, the prongs of the antler quite thin. And then I will turn them into points at the end. So instead of fingers, I'm going to put little points there. And you can curve some of them around. And there's the trolls. Antler. Now, who wants to be a, bi a biologist when they grow up? Very good. At least three of you. Four of you. Well, they say that a, a moose's antler, this is, these are the parts of your hand, your palm, your thumb, your fingers, your knuckles. But they say that this, the antler is palmate. 
which is like a palm of a hand. So you can remember that when you remember, let's see, how did that antler go? You can say, put my hand right there and I'll remember. Moose don't have eyebrows, but I'm going to take the fur around his eye. And I'm going to create an eyebrow. <coughs> and he's going to look even more surprised. But now comes the worried part. There he is. Just that one little line is going to make him look a little bit worried. And we'll put a little mark under his eye, too. And now he's even looking more worried. Do you see how that changes the expression? Just those tiny little lines. Now, all of you who uh, draw horses, most horses have a straight nose, except for the Arab might have a little dish right here. And that's what the moose has, a little dish right in the top. And then it comes down to the big blubbery nose. And you probably are wondering, how does Jan Brett know so much about moose noses? <laughs> and the reason why I know a lot about moose noses is because when we were in Sweden, we went up to Karuna that I told you about, up by the Arctic Circle. It was in April, but there was still snow around. And uh, there was, when we landed at the airport, there was a big poster that said Moose Park. And so there was a number, and we called it up, and they said, well, it's not tourist season, so we're not open. But if you want to come over, I'm going to feed the moose at 11 o'clock. So we went over to this man's place, and it was a beautiful barn. And he went out with a big bag of uh, grain, like you would feed a horse, only it was special for moose. And he made this whistle like this. And about 10 minutes later, eight moose came out of the forest. And they were habituated moose, which means that, well, he had brought them up, so they were used to people. And it was springtime. Now, moose in the spring are almost like horses. They're quite docile. But in the fall, they become very fierce. They're starting to fight for the females and their territories, and you can't even get near them. They can be dangerous. But it was spring, so we got to go and pat the moose, and I got to kiss them on their nose. And they were very soft and blubbery, even more than a horse. And it was like covered with velvet. And then this part of their coat was about six inches long. So when you patted it, your hand would just disappear in the fur. So underneath uh, uh, the reindeer's chin is something called a dewlap. It's just a piece of fur that hangs down. And uh, the older the moose gets the longer that dewlap gets. So I'm going to make him kind of happy. He's kind of excited about seeing the troll. And that's going to be all velvety, velvety, velvety there. And then here's his hump. And then I'll work a little bit on his, his antler, and then I'm going to color it in. So now he's got another one behind that, which if I had more time, I would draw for you. But I think we're going to stick with just coloring him in. And this is a, I don't, I'm thinking that you could make this for a card. So when you go to do yours, you could put a character up here, like I could draw an owl or a little bird sitting up there, or I could put um, a, some kind of beautiful ornament hanging down from his antler. So you think about what might be a good touch for you. I'll put a snowflake on this. So you think about what you might want to put on your antler. Because later at the end of my talk, in like about two few minutes, I'm going to have a challenge for you. And then he's going to have a very pretty collar because he's all brown. And I don't think that that's very colorful. So I'm going to make a fancy collar for him. And when we were in Sweden, we went to a lot of museums to see some of the old fabrics and stuff that I would use in my book that they have kept for to show in the museum at uh, Skansen is the museum that has all those animals, all the indigenous animals of Sweden. So now most of the moose that in the United States are kind of a, I would say they're uh, kind of a uh, dark, dark brown to black color. The ones I saw in Sweden were more like the ones on my backdrop. They were um, more uh, lighter colored, I think, because they lived so far north. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out by putting shading on him. And this is a technique that you can use no matter what you're drawing, a person, a turtle, or a moose, to make it look more re realistic. And I'm just going to go around the edge with a darker shade that would, than the actual color of the moose. And I'm using kind of a shaggy kind of technique of s when I'm using my strokes with my marker so that because he, he is shaggy. <laughs> And then the moose, I noticed all the moose had a little bit lighter around their eyes. 
and a little bit of lighter around their nose. So I won't do close in. I might use a lighter color for that. <coughs> and around his ear and then his antler. You can really see it start to work with the antler. And the antler is kind of, it can be, my antler that I brought to you just has been out all winter long in Swedish winter where it's very severe conditions. So it kind of got cleaned up by the weather. And a little shadow under there. And then oh, we'll put just a little shadow under his collar. And then his, his little bell. The man that had the, the moose in Sweden had bells on them, I guess, because sometimes they wouldn't come in with their food and he might have to go find them. <laughs> so he's kind of a brownish color. And I'll use my marker for that. And you can see how he'll start to come. Hopefully he'll come alive for you and he'll look like a real character. So, and when I'm home, it takes me an hour to do an inch, and I use my watercolors. So I didn't want to take too much time when I was doing my drawing today, but if you go on my website, I have lots of how to draw pages. I'm not sure if I have a moose. I definitely have a horse, a chicken, a dolphin, elephant, zebra, giraffe, all those animals if you want to go on my website, bear. Okay, so now that's his, then I'll just fill in his uh, collar. So when you do, if you end up doing this for a card, I think it would be really nice. You could make up your own uh, collar, the colors on your collar. You might make some nice, des a nice design. I'm making red and green stripes on mine. And I'm going to give this to, um, thank you to the, as a thank you to the, um, to the bookstore here because they invited me to be here and talk to you today. And rather than just doing a book signing, I wanted to talk to you about your artwork because I thought that that would be something that you might think was fun. Now I've got a pink here and that's gonna go on the inside of his nose and it'll maybe a little bit right there and then inside of his ear. And do I have a brown? Yes, that's gonna go and his iris and on the skin that shows right between the fur and his eye. I have a good color for his antler, but I'm just going to do part of the antler so that it won't take too long. It's really not that orange. I've got to find a better color. I think this color right here is going to work better. Yes, that's a much better color. Not quite as orangey. And oh, when I was patting the reindeer, their antlers had fallen off in the fall, because remember it was April, so they just had little tiny antlers growing, and when you patted them, it felt like velvet, and they were hot, because I guess they were growing so fast, and the, the, rain, uh, the uh, moose loved to have them rubbed, because I think they were itchy. So that was really fun to rub their little antlers, their baby antlers growing, and then it would, and just the boys have them, the, the cows do not. And here's a silver one that I'm going to make their bell. He's almost done. The only thing left I have is to put my name on it. And when you draw a picture, it's very important that you sign your artwork. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. And I'm also going to put the date, which is November. And the reason I'm putting November is 2011 is because artwork is just like learning to ride a bike or walking on a balance beam or playing an instrument. The more you practice, the better you get at it. And if you put, if you did a drawing work just before Thanksgiving now and you keep drawing and then next spring, if you remember and put the pi picture that you do then next to the one that you do now, you'll say, oh my gosh, look at all the improvement. And all you would have done is practice. Thank you very much for being such a great artist.